much better sleep than most of you, so um, I'll do my best to keep you awake. Uh, I'll be awake, so that's a good thing. Um, why don't we get into this? Uh, yesterday, I introduced you to the book of Jonah. I told you that it's a book about God's boundless compassion that should comfort us, but also confront us. Uh, we learned in chapter one that God is a powerful God who we should fear and not flee from. And then we saw in chapter two that God is a saving God who we should praise and not be proud before. Today, what we're going to learn is that God is a compassionate God who we should repent to and who we should replicate. I repeat that because the big idea of this sermon and of these chapters, that God is a saving God, sorry, God is a compassionate God who we should repent to and who we should replicate. Why don't I pray before we get into the book? Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for your compassion to us. And Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy. I pray as we come to read your scriptures now that you may help us to see how great our sin is, but how great our Savior is as well. Help us, Father, to come before you in repentance, but then also to replicate your compassion, to imitate you and follow you. And we pray this in Jesus' name, for Jesus' fame. Amen. Um, A few weeks ago, I met this guy called Shane. Uh, And he was a really interesting guy, a really intimidating guy. He was a big guy and he had facial hair like a bikey. Um, And I got to know Shane and he told me that he grew up in Melbourne when he was a young boy. But uh, when he was 14 years old, he got kicked out of his home. Uh, He was just a naughty kid, a violent kid. And at around about the same age, he started to take drugs. Uh, So he was 14 years old, he was taking drugs. and, And it didn't take long until he started to deal drugs. And then he started to earn some money, so he started to deal some more drugs, and he started his own drug empire, which he was in charge of. Um, At the time, he told me he was a very violent kid, a very bitter kid. He was a teenager, uh, but he thought he was invincible. He thought he was untouchable. And then he got sentenced to jail. He ended up getting sentenced to jail a few times for drug offences and for being violent and a whole lot of other things. And for the next 10 years, he was in and out of 14 different jails around Australia. At one point in time, he was just over his lifestyle. He was over being in jail. And so he was determined to to start a new life. And so he was in Melbourne at the time and so he decided, okay, I'm going to get out of jail. I'm going to travel up to Queensland. There's going to be better hope if I go up there. But then on the bus trip up there, he got in an argument with the bus driver, got in a fight, and then got put in jail again. And then went, okay, I'm going to go to New South Wales, to Sydney. That's going to be a place where there's going to be hope and new life. Came down to Sydney. He tried his best he can to be a good person. And then he ended up going to jail again. He ended up going to Bathurst Jail, one of the toughest jails in Australia. And he was just down, depressed, lonely, and just over it. I wonder if Shane was to walk in these doors this morning, I wonder if we would show him compassion. I wonder if we would love him. I wonder if we would judge him with our minds or we would love him with our minds. I I wonder if Shane asked us, not for money necessarily, but he walked in these doors and said, look, can I have some food? I'm really hungry. Or can I I have some clothes? I'm just, I'm really cold. Or or can I just have some help to find a job or some, some sort of basic lifestyle needs? Would we show compassion to him? If Shane walked through these doors this morning, I wonder, would we want to share the gospel with him? Would we tell him about the good news of Jesus Christ? Would we show Shane compassion? Would God show Shane compassion? I think we know the answer to that, but we're going to see in particular the answer to that in these next two chapters. You see, like I said, the big idea of these two chapters is that God is a compassionate God who we should repent to and a compassionate God that we should replicate, or in other words, imitate. So like I always do, I'm going to explain the story and then I'm going to apply the story. So if you've got your Bibles open, keep them open at Jonah chapter 3. Uh, Before I read verse 1, let me just give us a quick reminder of what's occurred. We met Jonah, chapter 1. God said, go to Nineveh. He said, hell no, went the other direction. God's like, all right, you want to play this game? God threw a storm at him. Um, And then all of a sudden, uh, Jonah got thrown overboard. He got held out of the boat. And then God sent a whale that came and saved him. In the whale, he prayed. And then the whale vomited out onto land near Nineveh. And now Jonah decides to obey God. Look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. I mentioned this yesterday, but Nineveh is a great city. It was the largest city at the time. It was a very prosperous city. It was um, great for its power. It was great for its prestige, great in its sin. 
You see, the city of Nineveh had a reputation for its arrogance and for its brutality. Like I said, it was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, the biggest empire at the known time. And it was Israel, that is Jonah's country, his homeland, his homeland greatest enemy, greatest threat to security and to survival. And what occurs? Look at verse 4. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. In this message, Jonah's preaching judgment, but implied in it is grace, if they were to repent. You see, God didn't send Jonah to go to Nineveh to taunt them, to unlovingly say, you're sinful, you're going to be judged. No, he sent Jonah to go to Nineveh in a loving way to say, you're sinful, you're going to be judged, but if you repent, there'll be mercy. What happened? How did they respond? Verse 5. And I'll read to verse 9. The Ninevites believed God and a fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on a sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to the city. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways, their violence. Who knows? God may relent with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Can you imagine this? Like, like literally, try and imagine this for a second, right? You're, like you're in, you're in Nineveh and this foreigner, this dude that just looks weird, like comes into your city, he's just came out of a whale, so he's like probably hungry, he's like seasick, smells like fish, and, and just like walks into the city, and then he just says eight words. Eight words, right? Nineveh, you're going to perish, I think he said, like it's going to be overthrown in eight words, and the whole entire city just goes nuts. The whole entire city is just transformed. The whole entire city is just broken. They just repent, get on their knees, rip off their clothes, and then put on sackcloth, which is like equivalent to you and I putting on black garbage bags and getting down on the ground and saying, God, forgive us. God, show mercy to us. This is an incredible scene, but it's so bizarre at the same time. Like, it'd be like me walking into your church at Penshurst, right, on a Sunday morning, and be like, in 40 days, Penhurst is going to be overthrown. Like, how would you guys respond? Like, I reckon you'll laugh at me, yeah. I, I, you know, I reckon some of you would throw a chair at me. I reckon Enmon would get a chair and literally hit me in the face. Like, honestly, I, I, I don't reckon we would rip off the clothes and get garbage bags and put it on us, would we? This scene is incredible. The whole city was going to be judged. The whole city was going to be... Um, perish. And so what happens? The whole city, including the animals, is told to not be allowed to eat and to put on sackcloths. This is an incredible scene. But you know what makes it even more incredible? Is the contrast between the Ninevites and Jonah. Like, like let me point out a few things to you. You see, unlike Jonah, the Ninevites, they feared God. They understood what it meant to rebel against God and that judgment was coming. They feared God, number one. Number two, the Ninevites, unlike Jonah, repented immediately. Like the whole entire city. Number three, they humbled themselves before God, took off their clothes and didn't eat and fast before Him. The contrast is just amazing as you look at the rebellious prophet, the, the guy who won't repent of his one sin, and then you see the wicked Ninevites willing to repent immediately. The contrast is insane. And how did God, sorry. Um, and how did God respond? Well, verse 10, what do we see? When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented, didn't he? He showed compassion. He did not bring destruction that he had threatened. This compassion is shocking, isn't it? It's pretty incredible. Like I've tried to explain to you how wicked these people were, how violent these people were, and God shows compassion to them. You know, it'd be almost like I said, the people of, the, of ISIS today repenting and then all of the world just showing them compassion, loving them and caring for them. That, like, that would be insane. That would be shocking. That's, that's just crazy. These people deserve judgment. 
And in a moment, we're going to have a look and see how Jonah responds to that. But before we do, I want to answer one question. And that is, is why did God forgive the wicked Ninevites? Why? What's the purpose? What is God doing here? Why didn't he judge them? And I think there's two, um, I guess, answers to that question. You see, I think the first one is that God wanted to tell us and the people of Israel that God is not a national God, but he's an international God. He's not a national God, but he's an international God. He cares for all people. And this is important. You see, the original readers of this book, the Israelites, they would have been reading this book of Jonah for the first time. And when they did, they wouldn't have been in Israel. Instead, they would have been in Babylon. They would have been in exile. Let me give you a bit of history and context. You see, these same people, the Assyrians, the Ninevites, who are repenting right now, only a hundred years later, come to Israel and wipe out the majority of Israel. They come and they kill Jonah's families, kill Jonah's friends, or the generations of them. And then that same empire, the Syrian Empire, ended up getting demolished by another empire known as the Babylonian Empire. They came through and wiped out the Assyrians. And then they came through and then they also wiped out some of God's people. And they took God's people back to Babylon to exile. And so I think when God's people read the book of Jonah for the first time, they're in exile and they're thinking, why God, why would you forgive our enemies? Why would you forgive these wicked people? They're clearly wicked. Only a hundred years later, they came and they hurt us and they killed us. Why? And like I said, I think it's to show that God is not a national God. He's just not the God of Israel. He's the God of all nations. But there's more to it than that. You see, I think the second thing is that God was teaching Israel and us that God is a God who relents judgment in response to repentance. You see, I was just mentioning to you that Israel got wiped out, but what you don't understand is that Israel, like I said yesterday, was like Jonah. They were nationalistic, they were proud, they claimed to worship God or Yahweh, but instead they worshipped idols. They were rebellious like Jonah. They weren't innocent, they were wicked and sinful, just like the Ninevites. They maybe just weren't as violent, but they were just as sinful. You know, what's interesting is God, he sent many prophets. Like majority of the Old Testament is of prophets like Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, going to God's people, pleading with their hearts and saying, look, you're sinful. God's going to judge you. Repent. You're sinful. God's going to judge you. Repent. That's just a pattern that's over and over again in the Old Testament. God sent many prophets with thousands of words to them. And yet, you know what's interesting is with Nineveh, he sent one prophet with eight words and they repented straight away. You see, God is trying to teach the people of Israel who are in exile as they read this for the first time that God relents judgment when people repent. That God wouldn't have sent the Assyrians or the Babylonians to Israel if they just repented of their idolatry and they worshipped the true God. This is a truth that's also applicable to us today. God will forgive people if they repent. God will forgive all people if they repent, people as wicked as the Ninevites. That God's capacity to forgive is greater than our capacity to sin. That our sin reaches far, but God's grace reaches even farther. That we can't out-sin the grace of God. That He is that good of a God that no one is unsavable, no one's un- unforgivable, that no one is unchangeable. That our God is that good. And that is comforting to us, is it not? It means that whenever we rebel against God and we think, no, God wouldn't forgive us of this, that we know, yes, he will actually. We can look to the Ninevites and we can think, man, like, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think any one of you here has killed anyone. If you have, that's weird. I wish William told me that before I came here so I was, you know, a bit more protected. But I'm assuming the majority of us here don't think that. But I think at times we may think, man, will God really forgive me for that sin? And yes, yes. God is a God of grace and he relents judgment when we repent. But what is repentance? I've mentioned yesterday that I don't think Jonah repented. I think that he was regretful. I gave you the illustration of Will calling Loretta a gold digger and him just getting in the car and saying she looks beautiful and he missed her and he's thankful for her saving him, but he didn't actually say sorry. Um, So what is repentance? Well, I think repentance is, uh, is breaks it down, you break it down to three R's. So hopefully this will be helpful, three R's, memory triggers. I think repentance is remorsefulness followed by revulsion followed by a resolution. Let me repeat that. I think repentance is remorsefulness followed by a revulsion followed by a resolution. So firstly, repentance is remorsefulness. You feel sorry for what you did. You think what you did was wrong. 
and you are sorry, you are hurt, you are broken by what you did, and you wish you didn't do it. That's the first one, remorsefulness. Secondly, though, it's revulsion. You see, repentance is not just feeling sorry for your sin, but it's also actually literally trying to hate your sin. You're revolted by it. You really don't want to do it again because you see how bad it is. You're revolted by your sin. But then thirdly, it's a resolution. It's a resolution that you're remorseful so much that you are revolted by it so much that you're going to make a resolution to not do it again. You see, repentance is not just an attitude, but it involves action. That's what it means to repent. So that's repentance. That's how God responded. But, but how did, what did Jonah think of God's response? What did Jonah think of God's great compassion to this great city? Well, in Jonah, in Jonah chapter 4, we're going to see that Jonah thinks that God's great compassion was a great evil. Let's look at Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. Let me read it to you. But to Jonah, this, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I uh, stole by fleeing to Tarshish? I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah's annoyed. Like he's really frustrated at God. He thinks what God did was a great evil. And in these few verses, we see Jonah's heart, don't we? Like we see why he fled from God, because he knew God is a God of compassion. He knew God would forgive. And then in Jonah chapter 2, we can see how he really wasn't repentant. Like he's justifying his sin here, is he not? He is so angry that he wants to die. He is questioning God's character. We question God's character too as well. But I think we question God's character for the opposite reasons to Jonah. You see, Jonah was questioning God's character because he was showing compassion. But I, I'm going to make an assumption here, but I reckon a lot of us here, we question God's character because he doesn't show enough compassion in our life. You see, we talked about suffering on the first sermon and talking about how um, God works through our suffering, but usually in our suffering, we're like, why God, why God is this happening? And we question God's character for not showing enough compassion. Yet Jonah's questioning God's character here for showing compassion at all. It's incredible, but what's interesting is, I think is in Australia, we obviously value comfort, we value pleasure, and we don't go through hardship, and so of course we want compassion, more compassion. But for Jonah in the Middle East, when he's got enemies that are killing people, he wants judgment. So let me ask you, is it right for Jonah to question God's character, to be angry at him? And is it right for us to be angry at God when he doesn't show us compassion? Is it right to be angry at God when he does show compassion? And is it right to be angry at God when he doesn't show enough compassion? What's the answer? Well, I think the answer is no, it's not right. You see, no one deserves God's compassion. It's a gift that he gives to us. In this story, we see that everyone in this story is sinful. The sailors are idolatrous. Jonah is rebellious. The Ninevites are wicked. And the reality is the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that we all rebel against God, that we're all like Jonah, that we are all like the sailors, that we are all like the Ninevites. Maybe just to different degrees, but at the end of the day, and I, and I think I don't need to tell you this, like you don't need to turn on the TV to see the sinfulness of humanity, you just need to look in the mirror. I think God makes that clear to us on our conscience, that we rebel against Him. But God, He's not just a God of justice, He's a God of compassion. He's a God that seeks sinners, saves sinners, uses sinners, loves sinners. And so he shows compassion to the people in this story. And that is just incredible. Jonah thinks he's better than these Ninevites. He's taking God's grace for granted. Jonah's heart is appalling. And so God teaches him a lesson. Look at verse 5 to 9. So Jonah had gone out and he sat down at a place at the east of the city and there he made himself a shelter, sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Now this is really funny. After Nineveh repented, instead of going back to Israel, Jonah's like, no, nah, no, nah, this is ridiculous. So he literally goes outside the city, like sits down, builds a shelter so he can try and watch the city, hoping that God would change his mind and just be like, boom, and just like blow up the city, right? But obviously that wasn't going to happen. And so apparently... Jonah's just being weird, but he sits down, builds this shelter, and apparently he's not a good carpenter, just like he's not a good prophet. And so God, in compassion, helps him out. 
Verse 6, the Lord provided a leafy plant or a vine to make it grow over Jonah to give it shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at the dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head and he grew faint. He wanted to die and he said, it'd be better for me to die than to live. This is just insane. Um, And then God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Like, this is just insane. Like, he's, he builds a shelter. It's a terrible shelter. So God, in his compassion, raises up a vine. God then, Jonah gets happy. He's like, yes. Then God sends a worm in the wind, gets rid of the plant. And then Jonah's like, oh, I, I want to die. Like, it's, it's pretty absurd. Like, it reminds me, it's pretty insane. It reminds me of my son sometimes. Like, recently the other day, um, I love my son. He's a cute little boy. But the other day, he had a humongous tantrum at me because I wouldn't let him walk to New Zealand. And I was trying, I was trying to explain to him, and he's like, no, I just wouldn't want to have any of it. And, and I think at, at this point in time, I think Jonah's being just as dumb. Like, he's just getting so annoyed. He wants to die over a plant. He's just being absurd. And what does God do? He gently rebukes Jonah. He says in verse 10, he says, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from the left, and also the many animals? God here gently rebukes Jonah. Or maybe not gently, maybe just plainly, bluntly rebukes Jonah. He's like, how come you can have compassion for this temporary plant, which was here for one day and gone the next, and I can't have compassion for this great city of many people, immoral people, and also many animals? We see God's balanced compassion here. He not only cares for people, he also cares for animals in this story, which is pretty incredible. This is a cool story. And what we see is Jonah has a hard heart and God was calling Jonah to love his enemies. And Jonah failed. Jonah had a hard heart, a bad heart. Jonah was not up to the task. Jonah couldn't love his enemies. He was a failed prophet. But what do we know about the scriptures? We know that a better prophet came a better prophet who was able to love his enemies, unlike Jonah. Jesus, our Lord, who at the cross loved his enemies. At the cross, when you and I were his enemies, he loved us, died for us, resurrected for our sin and salvation. Jesus, who as he hung on the cross, said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they do. Jesus, who heard God's call to go to the nations who do not know who God is, and he did so and proclaimed the word of God and started the mission of God to go to the ends of the world to bless the nations. Jesus was the better Jonah. You see, this book is about God's boundless compassion and we see it the most clearly at the cross where God's boundless compassion is shown to all people of all time. This book is about God's boundless compassion. I've said that so many times and I hope you get it. He shows compassion to the sailors. He shows compassion to Jonah. He shows compassion to the Ninevites. And this book ends with God asking the question to Jonah, can I not show compassion? But I wonder if you picked up on the reality that we actually don't know if Jonah's heart changes. We don't know if Jonah gets it. We don't know if Jonah's like, yeah, God, I should be compassionate too. It's almost like it's not the point of the book, how Jonah ends up. The point of the book is whether or not you and I understand God's boundless compassion and whether or not we will replicate that. That's the point of the book. Jonah's not the hero. Jonah's not the point of the book. It's whether or not we will respond as God wanted Jonah to respond. You see, this book is supposed to rebuke us but also inspire us. You see, it's supposed to rebuke us as we come to understand that there's a little Jonah inside all of us. There's a little Jonah inside of all of us at times that instead of fearing God, we'll flee from God. Instead of praising God, we'll be proud before God. Instead of repenting to God, we'll be unrepentant. There's a little Jonah inside all of us. We can all be hard-hearted and religious. You see, this book is trying to remind us of our great sin, but then it's also trying to inspire us of our great Saviour. It's trying to inspire us to show compassion like God shows compassion, to love all people, not just people that are like ourselves, to love people of all ages, races and nations and religions, to show compassion like God shows compassion. So how do we show the compassion of God? How do we replicate the compassion of God? How do we imitate the compassion of God? Well, I think three ways. With our minds, with our hands and with our mouths. With our minds, our hands and our mouths. Firstly, with our minds. 
Uh, when Jonah got told to go to Nineveh, straight away he could have judged Nineveh or loved Nineveh, and he chose to judge them. He chose to think that he was better than them. You and I, we face this every day. Whenever someone walks through this door at school, whenever you meet someone for the first time, when you see someone walking down the street, you have a decision in your mind to love them or judge them. Let me explain this. You have a decision to judge them, number one. You can go, you know what? I don't like what they're wearing. You know what? I don't like the tattoos that they've got. You know what? I just don't think they're a good person. I think I'm better than them. And you, what you do is you put them below you and you put yourself above them. You judge them. Or you have a choice to love them with your minds. When you see them, instead of judging them, you can go, you know what? They're made in the image of God. God loves them. I want to love them. And so you value them above yourself and you care for those people. Let's do that. Let's seek to show the compassion that God has. So the next time you see a girl who doesn't know Jesus dressing inappropriately, instead of judging her, instead you think to love her. And see, when, next time you see an angsty teenager that thinks he's really tough on the street, don't judge him, but instead seek to love him like God loves him. With our minds that show compassion, but secondly with our hands. You know what's incredible in this story is God shows compassion to the desperate. He delivers people physically as well as spiritually. And so let's us do that as well. Let's seek to love the poor, give money to the poor, but also with our hands, support the poor, support the desperate when we get a chance. Look for people in our lives that need to be, have compassion shown to them. Thirdly, with our mouth. And how do we do this? Well, we share the good news of the gospel. We share the good news of the gospel. You know what's interesting in our life is, I think a lot of us are afraid to talk about Jesus' love because we fear how people will respond to what we say. And in that moment, we choose to fear people rather than love people. We choose to fear people rather than love people. Instead of fearing the Lord, we fear people. And that's a good litmus test for our heart. Do we have compassion for people or do we fear them? Will we show compassion like God shows compassion? This weekend, we've looked at God's love. We've come to look at God's compassion. Like I said, we learn about a God who is powerful, who we should fear and not flee from, a God who's saving, a God that we should praise and not be proud before, a God who's compassionate, who we should repent to and who we should replicate. Fourteen times the Hebrew word gadol, which means great, is repeated throughout this book. And I reckon the reason why the writer's doing this is so we come to see that our God is a great God. Sure, it's a great city, great fish, great evil, but our God is a great God. At the start, I told you about my friend Shane and how he ended up being in the Bathurst jail, down and des- desperate and lonely. Uh, what he ended up doing is he ended up going to um, a Christian chaplain and, and basically he was ho- hoping that the, the Christian guy would give him free cigarettes, free food, free something, show compassion to him. Because he thought he's Christian, he should be a good guy. So he went to this chaplain and he asked for help and, and this prison chaplain helped him and showed compassion to him, but also this prison chaplain also shared the gospel with him. He explained to him God's boundless compassion and how he forgives all people as long as they repent. Shane, right then and there, repented of his sin and put his faith in Jesus Christ. He then was born again. He then went back to his prison cell. He ripped down inappropriate images on his cell. He then went out to his cellmate and started to proclaim the gospel to them. He then got out of jail and went to church, continued to read the Bible and he'd grown in God's love for him. Now he's a ferocious man of God. This guy, whenever I see him, I call him Bible verse wearing Shane because he's always got a Bible verse t-shirt on or a jumper on. He, goes to, he lives in Cabramatta and he goes there and he street preaches because he wants people to hear the gospel. The other day he was telling me he was street preaching and a drunk came up to him in his face and was yelling at him. And like, this dude's been in jail 14 times. Like, he's not afraid. And so he just didn't care. The cops came, took away the drunk dude as he continued to preach the gospel while the cops did so. He's at Bible college with me. And I got to know him a few weeks and now he's a good friend. You see, he came to understand God's boundless compassion. He repented of his sin, but then also he wanted to replicate God's boundless compassion through preaching the gospel, but also loving people. Well, we do the same. The questions are, will we fear God or will we flee from God? Will we praise Him or will we be proud before Him? Will we repent to Him and will we replicate His compassion? Let me pray to close. Father God, we thank You for the great God You are. Uh, Lord, we pray that we may come to understand who You are rightly so we may worship You and live in response to You. Uh, Father God, we thank You that You are a just God but also a compassionate God. Lord, I pray you help us not to flee from you, but to run to you. 
I pray you help us to fear you rightly and to worship you in reverence and respect, that we may praise you and not be proud before you, that we may repent to you, but then at the same time we may replicate your compassion. We love you and we praise in Jesus' name. Amen.